brothers and sisters in Christ, welcome to Real Life, Real Gospel. This is our third episode. We're so happy that you have found us. Um, we do have two previous episodes. If you would ever want to go back and look at those, we can be found on YouTube, on Spotify, on iTunes, and on Podbean. I believe that's it for now. We are sponsored by St. Paul Lutheran Church and School here in Boca Raton, Florida. So, um, that is where I work out of. I am the vicar there. And we try to put this podcast out every week to address issues in society, in people's real lives, um, that maybe are are tougher questions, harder to answer, and sometimes, like today, maybe a little uncomfortable to talk about. So... With that being said, this week we are talking about immigration and the border. Um, The past two weeks we've talked directly about topics that someone has requested from us. Someone has requested via a social media post or something like that, which I encourage you to do. If you have something you want to hear about on this podcast, reach out, send me an email, send me a Facebook message, leave a comment on any one of the platforms that we broadcast on. But as I was going through the process of finding topics for the show and looking at people's requests, one request that didn't come up, but that came across my my social media in a couple different ways was the topic of immigration. And as that continued to come across my social media feeds, I kept thinking, that's a tough topic. That's a tough tough topic for Christians to think about. Maybe it's worth talking about. And I would, I, I want to make a plea and a prayer to each and every one of you right now. And that is, most people have fairly strong opinions on this topic. There are some people who... Um, who have a very hardline stance on immigration. If you don't come in a certain way, then we should kick you out. And then there are some people that say there should be no laws surrounding immigration and everybody should just be able to come and go as they please. And what I would ask both sides, no matter how you feel about either direction, please stick with me for this whole podcast because I do, I, I do my best, at least I think I do my best, to give both sides of the argument a fair examination and a fair look as we look at the reality of Scripture and the reality of Christian doctrine and Christian ethics when it comes to the topic of immigration. So with that, what I would like to do is start, as I usually do, in the Old Testament. And we're going to start in Deuteronomy 24, starting at verse 19, where we're told, When you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in that field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat your olive trees, you shall not go over them again. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you shall not strip it afterward. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. You shall remember that you are a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I command you to do this. I have a couple more Old Testament passages actually for you so we can get uh, a broader look at this. The second one comes from Jeremiah 22 where it says, Thus says the Lord, Do justice and righteousness. And deliver from the hand of the oppressor him who has been robbed. And do no wrong or violence to the resident alien, the fatherless, and the widow, nor shed innocent blood in this place. And finally from Zechariah 7, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Render true judgments, show kindness and mercy to one another, do not oppress the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, or the poor, And let none of you devise evil against one another in your heart. So a couple of explanatory notes, a couple of textual notes for you as we go forward. In Deuteronomy, well, in in all these passages, the sojourner comes up. And the people that we we call immigrants today, it's a fairly good parallel to the sojourner. And in 
Deuteronomy, what it's getting at is leave your excess behind for immigrants and for others who may have a tougher time preparing, uh, taking care of themselves, providing for themselves. And as it goes through this verse, we just, we just read through this verse, and it cl- closes with, you shall remember that you are a slave in the land of Egypt. And we think, or at least I thought when I first read this, that sounds kind of out of place. Like, that sounds kind of weird. Why would you encourage people to support those who are more unfortunate in their midst and then remind everybody that you are a slave? And the reason for that, at least as far as I can tell, is what God is kind of reminding his people is you know how hard it is to be in a foreign land, to be in a place where it's more difficult to support yourself. So remembering that, support people who are in those tougher positions. So those are textual notes on Deuteronomy. Um, Some notes on Jeremiah. It's saying, do no wrong or violence to the resident alien. And this passage was being spoken to King David. And a lot of times when people talk about immigration today and passages like this are brought up, and passages like this are brought up in support of supporting immigrants. A lot of times the context that's brought up is that, oh, our modern nation states don't compare to the Israelites as they were being talked to. They were nomadic people. Which, first of all, if you have to use historical context to basically flip the meaning of a passage you're probably not actually getting at the meaning of the passage. You're trying to make it say what you want it to say. If you're using historical context to maybe refine and understand a little better what it's saying, I think that's a great use of historical context. But if you're using historical context as an excuse to say this passage doesn't apply anymore, then we maybe need to look at it a little bit more honestly. So this was spoken today. David was close. He had a stationary capital. His borders were fairly well established. And there was definitely a sense of a national identity in Israel. So as these words are being spoken to David, I think it's more fair than not to say that this does kind of, this can apply to how our nation works today. And then finally on Zechariah, This is getting at show mercy and kindness to one another. Do not oppress the sojourner. So what the Old Testament shows us is, in reality, this is getting at the character of our God. Because the Old Testament as a whole shows us over and over again how God acts with his creation and with his people. And when he instructs his people to act a certain way, I th- we get a valuable window into the character of God, into the will of God for how his people act and interact within his creation. What we see here is that God cares about people regardless of their national identity. And God expects and God calls his people to do the same. So what can we take away from this, from the Old Testament displaying to us the nature of God's character and his expectations for his people is that we are called to care for our immigrant neighbors, to show them kindness and mercy. And this isn't contingent upon legal status, which is, I know, know something we, we love to draw on, but God doesn't say only love people who are doing the right things. God says, show love and mercy to people who need love and mercy. We're called to love everybody. So, I want to preface this podcast by talking about people like their people. So no matter what the conversation is that you're having around immigration, um, to be frank, calling someone an illegal, I don't think is a Christian. I don't think is an appropriate way to talk about anyone. To call someone a degrading name just because they came from somewhere else, whether that's legally or illegally, that is not showing mercy and love, and that is what we're called to do. As we move forward, the what I really want to pull out of this Old Testament is we're called to love people 
who are in a position where they need love or mercy. And where we ought to talk about people as if they're people. So the real life situation that we're addressing here is immigration is an issue that we have to deal with in our nation. And there's a tendency that comes along with that to group people and then to paint those groups of people in pretty broad strokes. But the real gospel that comes out of this situation is that God loves all his created people, regardless of their cultural or national background. And we, as Christians, are called and expected to love our immigrant neighbors because immigrants are People, immigrants are God's created people, God's loved people. And as we look at that, a lot of people might struggle with that a little bit because there is this aspect and reality to civil law, which is why for our epistle, what we're going to look at for our our New Testament lesson, I want to pull on Romans 13, where it says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but bad. Would you have no fear for the one who is in authority? Then do what is good and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is a servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. So my textual notes for this passage from Romans is this is calling us to be subject to governing authorities. And the reality that comes along with that is that includes the government of our nation. We are to be subject to them. This includes subjugation to the laws that we have. Because as it says in this passage, they're not a terror to good conduct. And there is this appropriate punishment to the evildoer. So when it comes to immigration, there are laws in this country. Laws that we are called and expected to uphold and support. We are subject to immigrations and customs enforcement. They are part of the government. They are part of the authority that has been placed over us. And as Romans tells us, that authority would not be allowed to exist if it wasn't from God. And what this presents us with, because I'm sure... uh, If people really are are resonating, if you are sitting here and you're really resonating with this Romans text where we're called to obey the civil law, you may have been a little bit more uncomfortable with the Old Testament text where we're called to love our neighbor regardless of where they come from. And if you really resonated with those Old Testament texts, you may struggle a little bit with this, this subjugation to civil authority. And this draws out the reality that there is a duality that we wrestle with as Christians dealing with this issue in this country. You see, on one hand is the argument, we must love our neighbor. On the other hand, we must be subject to the authorities. So our challenge going forward is finding the ground where they meet. And I know you're not going to like this, but as we move forward, the reality of that ground is, is it is subjective. And let me explain that a little bit more, is it depends on the situation, which we will continue to discuss as we move forward. Keeping in mind that our call above all else is to obey God rather than man, to remember that we live in both a spiritual and a temporal realm, And then we balance this idea of care for neighbor versus care for nation. So the real life that comes out of this segment that I want to draw out of this segment is we are called and expected to uphold the civil law. Illegal immigration is a violation of that law as it stands today. And we ought to support the authorities in this. (laughs) 
The real gospel that comes out of this situation, though, is just as inescapable as our command to uphold civil law is our promise that we are loved and our our command to love our neighbor. And a reminder that Christ does love and forgive us even in the midst of our disobedience. So now I've, I've hopefully, if you have listened with genuineness and hopefully I've spoken as clearly as I intended to, we have reached a point of duality when it comes to the, the most common views on immigration. Hopefully moving us closer toward an understanding, a framework of how to address this We have Matthew 25, which says, Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? When did we see you in sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, As you did it to one of the least of my brothers, you did it to me. So the textual notes I have for you are to start off, he gathered all the nations. And here's where I'm I'm probably going to upset a couple of you. But the reality of the world is that America is not God's chosen nation. Hear me clearly when I say this. I love living here. I am blessed to have been born here. I am incredibly thankful for all of the freedoms and and joys of being an American. However, God has only ever adopted one specific people, and that was Israel. And then when Christ came, he brought into that covenant to all peoples and all nations. There is no secret code in the Bible that says America is now God's new chosen people. So as as we look at this, he gathered all the nations. Not just America, not just certain ones, all of them. And the reality that this brings before us is God probably doesn't care a whole lot about the cultural identity of a nation outside of its behavior, its reaction, its action in accordance with his will and his laws. So a lot of people, part of their desire to have a more closed border comes from a desire to preserve the cultural identity of America. And I I would say to you as a brother in Christ that God probably doesn't have let me let me be strong on this, actually. God does not have an interest in preserving the cultural identity of a nation at the expense of the gospel, at the expense of loving our neighbor. And in this passage, as we get to the end, it says, we're called to welcome the stranger because if we do that for the least of our brothers, we do that for Christ. So, the least of all of the people on this earth, if we welcome them even as strangers, we are doing that for Christ. And the real life of this is we are called to care for and advocate for the oppressed and the stranger. And what this might look like at some point is civil disobedience because we are called to obey God rather than man. So if the instance were to come up, where we had to choose between a civil authority and the command to love our neighbor, we would be called to love our neighbor first. And there is there is a lot of nuance in that. There is a lot of discussion to be had in that. But I'm trying to open that discussion, open that process of thought for you. And what this 
in reality, what this looks like, if you look at the scripture, is advocating for change. Because right now we are in a duality. We are in a paradox. And sometimes we come to these sticky situations. So we have the blessing in America to go before our lawmakers and say, this, our, our current immigration policies aren't in line with our character. They aren't in line for our values as Christians. We would like to see them changed. We would like to see more compassion built into our laws. So maybe that is what it looks like. We do our best to try and resolve the difference between the civil law and our Christian values. That's the real life of this. And at this point, I'm going to, I don't know if this is a tangent or not, but I want to throw this in here. Biblically conservative does not directly align with politically conservative. Biblically conservative does not directly align with politically conservative. I am a biblically conservative Christian. I believe the Bible is the inspired word of God and that it is inerrant. That does not mean I agree with political conservatives on every issue. And this is increasingly one of them because if we are being conservative biblically, if we are really listening to what the scriptures honestly have to say to us, It raises real issues with the laws as they stand. My real gospel for you in the midst of this, if you are feeling uh, a struggle, if you are feeling convicted, is that God can work wonders even in the midst of all of this mess and all of this chaos. And what this does currently provide for us as Christians is an opportunity for outreach in the midst of crisis. So summarizing, we have a framework that I'm trying to set up with you. And the first part of this framework is we are called to love our immigrant neighbor. That is a command that is an expectation of God for his people. We cannot escape that. At the same time, the second part of this framework is that we are called to obey civil law, which includes the immigration laws of the country. Thankfully, we live in a place where hopefully we can advocate and push for that civil law to come more in line with our command to love our neighbor. But right now, we have to struggle with that. Another part of the framework that I do want to speak to is vocation. And another part that we have to speak to is how much of this is spiritual versus how much of this is part of the the temporal realm, the earthly realm. And I would say that if we're looking at it, the love of neighbor is a spiritual need. And the obedience to the civil realm is a earthly, is a temporal one. So we have to weigh those accordingly. And to help bring this into a more dramatic sense where we can maybe look at the reality of this is I actually want to use a parallel example. And I want to use the parallel example of transgender children. Stick with me on this one. Say you have a transgender child who has declared or expressed or whatever the verbiage you want to use. They have declared as transgender. And you live in a state or in a city or in a country where seeking medical care to help them with any mental health issues that they are struggling with is against the law. Because, quote, that's not who they are. Here is another instance where we have to weigh civil disobedience to take care of that child in order to fulfill our vocation. And for, for those of you who right now are listening and you're thinking, it's not the same thing, it's not the same thing. A sin is a sin is a sin is a sin. Not taking care of your child's mental health is just as bad in the eyes of God as not loving your immigrant neighbor. So as you, uh, maybe if you lean toward the side of really sticking by the civil law, I would say, what if the civil law is something you don't already really agree with? And all I'm trying to do with this example is kind of open you up and what I want to do is genuinely consider the balance of all this the duality of all this, the struggle in all of this. 
So in conclusion, in closing, the real life reality is we have to consider a ton when we talk about immigration. We have to consider civil authority. We have to consider love for neighbor. We have to consider vocation. We have to consider the spiritual realm versus the temporal realm. And there are tough complications with this. What if someone comes to their ch- comes to your church? This woman is an illegal immigrant, but her family and her children, her husband and kids are legal residents of the United States. Do you advocate for deportation for her? Because then we are making it impossible for her vocation as mother and as wife to be fulfilled. Do you seek legal counsel? Do you, where does the balance, where is the balance fine? What if they're criminals? What if they need spiritual support? What if they are in spiritual crisis? All of these are, are a case-by-case consideration. So what I'm trying to do, what I hope I have done, is to give you a framework to say, every case isn't the same. And we really ought to consider each case on its own merit, in its own circumstances. And that is the real life reality of immigration. And the real gospel, the comfort I have for you today, even if this has been a really hard podcast for you, um, if that is the case, I'm proud of you for sticking through it. I'm proud that you... uh, You were willing to bear with me long enough to hear it out to the end. And the real gospel I have for you is that God will continue to work. He does and he will work, even in the midst of these struggles and difficulties. And that God loves us, no matter what side of the argument and no matter what side of the border. God loves his people, and he'll continue to take care of them. Thank you for listening. This has been episode three of Real Life, Real Gospel. Blessings on your week. I will speak to you next Thursday. Brothers and sisters, go in peace and serve the Lord.